It's ad break time. I'm proud to announce that the Beyond Solitaire podcast is sponsored by Central Michigan University's Center for Learning Through Games and Simulations. And as usual, they're up to some amazing things. Their next game, Hydrologic Cycle, is currently on Kickstarter, and you should absolutely go and check it out. CLGS also continues to offer classes in partnership with Gen Con. The next course, Jason Fury's Crowdfunding with Confidence, starts on May 6th and will teach you all about board games and crowdfunding. Go check it out. And I'll also include a final plug for myself. If you like the show and want to support it, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash beyond solitaire. Thanks to listeners like you. I've been able to keep upgrading my equipment, subscribing to StreamYard, and more. Uh, but for now, let's get on with the show. Hey, gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire. And this week on the pod, I'm here with a very special guest. This is Joe Dewhurst, designer and developer of many games for many companies. Uh, how are you doing, Joe? Hey, Liz. I'm doing really great. Uh, it's very nice to be on the show with you today. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, so for people who don't uh, know you and your work, uh, can you give us a sense of who you're working for and what you're doing? So I my, my main work is as a board game developer, and I do a lot of that with GMT Games at the moment, but I'm also developing a few games for other companies um, and, uh, you know, interested in looking at uh, other, other projects. Um, I also am a game designer. Um, I have two games on GMT's P500 at the moment and various other games at stages of development, as I'm sure you understand as well. Uh, many things at once. It's the way designers work. Indeed. Uh, what are your games that are on P500 right now? So I have a game called The Pure Land, which is going to be volume 14 in the coin series, um, which is a um, game. It's a, it's a four player game set in uh, 15th century Japan. So the start of um, what's called the Warring States period, but this is the end of it that people don't don't tend to know so well. Um, so it's about the collapse of the, of the Muromachi Shogunate um, into a kind of civil war status, and also about um, social conflicts at the time. So about uh, peasants and uh, kind of lower lower ranking nobles, and also um, the emerging Buddhist uh, sect, the Ikawiki, who are kind of kind of radical um, anti-establishment uh, sect. Um, so they, these kinds of things. Um, but yeah, that's on P five hundred at the moment, and hopefully we'll be moving into final stages of development for that later this year. It's been quite quite a long time, just because there's been lots of other coin volumes to get out of the way first. Um, and I also have a an expansion for Cuba Libre, so coin again um, on P five hundred called Resisting Revolution, um, and that is a kind of um, expansion consisting of several different components. So the main game uh, covers the period immediately after. Batista's fall, so from 1959 to 1962, so up to the Cuban Missile Crisis, and is about the kind of cons consolidation of Castro's regime, internal dissidents, um, external trouble from the US, um, the involvement of the Soviet Union, this kind of thing. That, that's a four-player kind of sequel expansion. Um, but I also have included in that a three-player variant game for the original, which kind of explores some different ways of thinking about the Cuban Revolution um, and some, some, some new event cards for that. Uh, and a, a very small two-player game on on the Bay of Pigs, which was actually how I first started working on this expansion. So many years ago now, me and a friend, Sean O'Keefe, almost as just a, a kind of game jam or kind of fun project, um, you know, wanted to come up with this variant using the existing Cuba Libre components. And I thought, why not also put this into the expansion? So it's, you know, it's just a little kind of maybe half hour, 45 minute two-player game, quick playing thing. Excellent. Those are very different historical periods. Um... Would you say that you have a broad interest or is there, yeah. is there a connection no, somewhere? Do. There is a connection. The connection broadly is um, social unrest and, and peasant unrest in particular. So a major aspect of the Pure Land is the involvement of these neutral peasant pieces, which can be kind of used and misused by different factions. Um, and they break out into, into peasant revolt sometimes. And something like the Cuban Revolution, I think, in, in many ways can also be thought of as a peasant revolt. There's, there's a major peasant revolt uh, component, although also urban unrest. Um, and this is something which I'm, I'm I'm really interested in. So particularly, uh, you know, different kinds of lower class revolt, but particularly peasant revolt in in different parts of the world. Um, also, urban unrest. Um, you know, other games I'm working on, for instance, is something to do with the the miners' strike in the UK, which you might think of again as a very different kind of topic, but it's this kind of um, urban unrest, social unrest topic. So that that's my my broad interest, I would say. Yeah, that's really interesting. And then I take it so. 
and all of your designs so far have been coined? Uh, yeah, they have. I'm kind of riffing on that system. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to move beyond that and explore some different things. So, you know, I've worked a lot on Coin, also in my development work, and had lots of conversations with other Coin designers about about the the limits of the system. Um, and we're, we're now starting to think about ways to do things a bit differently, and maybe move in different directions. Um, but I, I still really love the core of the Coin system. I think it's very very flexible and very kind of fun to play, while also showing you interesting stuff about history. So would you call yourself a designer or a developer first? Um, nowadays, a developer. So I, I first started with design, um, and I still enjoy design and want to be doing some design. Um, but I've, uh, you know, since I've got into development, that's become my main source of income. And I also think I'm actually more, uh, more inclined towards development, maybe more, you know, better suited to it, maybe even just better at it, full stop. Um, so that that's probably my my primary identity these days. Um, although the two things blur together very closely. So you know, some designers who I work with as a developer would would almost prefer to call me a co-designer, and it's a very close kind of working uh, interaction in in those cases. Um, but there's other there's other aspects to being a developer which I also uh, enjoy doing. You know, like editing and um, uh, organizing, you know, kind of kind of project management, which lots of designers aren't very good at, and I think I am quite good at. So that that's a kind of different skill set that I have to offer and enjoy doing. Yeah, it actually, kind of leads into something I wanted to ask, which is, what are the essential differences you see between the skill sets of a very good designer and the skill sets of a very good developer? Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's 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 different aspects to both of them, but you know, to be a designer, you need to have you need to have some some really good big ideas, some really interesting new ideas about, about what to do with a game. Um, you maybe also need to do a lot of historical research if you're a war game designer or a historical game designer. Um, and you need to um, have some kind of some some interesting or, or solid ideas about how to combine these historical themes with mechanics and how to put that together. Um, some extent you maybe need to be a kind of a big a big picture blue sky thinker for that, although some designers are much more detail focused as well. Um, whereas for the development, you don't necessarily need to have done the research or come up with the ideas yourself, but you need to be uh, good at um, refining those ideas, you know, making sure that they really fit together properly, uh, making sure it's all clear, making sure it all works well, um, you know, working on balance. So there's lots of things here which are perhaps more detail oriented and certainly more oriented at getting the project finished. Um, so, I mean, I, I when I'm explaining the job to people, I describe it as being closest probably to being an editor for books. Um, but it's a little bit more than that uh, in at least some of the roles I have. There's, there's almost a kind of more project management role as well. So you're, you're overseeing the whole project. You're communicating with lots of different people, like artists and like product managers um, and this kind of stuff to work out what components should be used, what they should look like, how many we need. You know, there's, there's all these little bits which are part of the job. Um, and you know, some, some designers could do that themselves. And I do that myself for my own games largely. Um, but you, you don't necessarily want designers to be doing that because they might not always be the best people to do that. They might not know all the details of these things. Um, so that's the kind of nitty gritty of it. The bit where it gets closer to design is where you're working with the designer to, um, you know, iterate on certain, certain mechanisms. And, you know, I, I might have some ideas how to solve a problem the designer has. So that, that's a lot closer to design, but you're kind of bouncing ideas off of each other for that bit. So how did you get started in development i mean i I, yeah. I feel like people design a game they go to a convention they pitch it maybe as like a very base form of getting into design but how do you get into development yeah good good question um i got into development through playtesting and i got into playtesting through through design so you know i've been working on this coin design with cureland and jason carr at gmt saw uh, so i didn't even pitch it which is cool i just been like posting some pictures of my you know fan design i was working on and then he approached me and said we're interested in this um it looks pretty good so yeah we started getting that to p500 um you know having chatted to jason i then started doing some 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 play testing uh work so on fall of saigon in particular which is a sequel to another coin game um and the way i like to put it i was so annoying as a play tester that jason decided he should hire me as a developer to you know better direct my my irritating uh you know, uh, overly focused uh, skills. So with, with Fall of Saigon, there used to be a victory condition where if uh, the North Vietnamese conquered Saigon, um, they could just win just like that. And I, I think I must have done that, you know, 10, maybe 20 times just over and over again, just to show that it was a bit broken as, as, as an objective. And, you know, it, it, it warped the game in really uh, bad ways. 
Um, and those kinds of skills, I think people like uh, and then wanted to pick on. And I, I, actually what happened is I, I asked Jason how, how he got into this work. He's the head of development at GMT Games. And he said, well, we're actually looking to hire someone else to work on it and you'd be great. So come and do the job. So really, I just lucked into it. But for anyone interested in, in development, I, I, I'd say get into playtesting, um, you know, work, do, do a lot of that and then um, see, see where that takes you. Makes sense. So it sounds like you're very good at pushing, finding pressure points in games, finding where things kind of twist out of shape. How do you do, I guess, the soft side of development work where mm. you have to communicate all of that with a designer? Like what kind of range yeah. of relationships with designers have you had? And how do you, I mean, I guess you're kind of going from their baby to like our baby. And, mm. you know, how do you finesse that? <laughs> So that, that's an interesting question, and it, it really varies a lot depending on the kind kind of relationship I have. So with uh, you know Fred Savell or Stephen Rangazas, uh, I'm I'm also quite good friends with them, and, and we work very closely through all stages of the design. Whereas uh, for some some designs where I maybe know the developer the, the, the designer less well, I might come into it at a a later stage and really just help out with the the playtesting once it's more more public and uh, work on refining things there. Um, so, you know, how I, how I interact with each of these designers will depend on, um, how they are as people. So there, there's actually a large people management skill to it, uh, too, I think. Um, so for instance, some designers might not react well to certain kinds of feedback from testers, and it can be useful, uh, in at least some cases for me to be a kind of, um, not, not a barrier, but a kind of communication bridge between testers and the designer to, to repackage the feedback and say, you know, here are, here are a bundle of issues the testers have been having. They've got these ideas of how to fix it, but we should probably ignore those. Here are my ideas of how we could fix it. Or, you know, here's the general thing they've been feeling. This this doesn't mean they hate the game. It just means there are maybe these, these issues we could work on. So there's a lot of um, translation, I would say, from the testers to the designer, and then also from the designer to the to the artists to the layout people. Um, so I I know how to describe how things should look in a way that will work well for a certain artist. Whereas um, for a designer who doesn't work, hasn't worked with that artist before, there could be a potential for for miscommunication there. So there's there's a lot of a lot of uh, that kind of stuff going on as well. Yeah. Nice. How many game does it, how many development projects do you work on at the same time? Uh, a lot, a lot. Um, so maybe so certainly more than ten right now. Um, some somewhere between ten and twenty. Those are at various different stages of. Um, of, of the process. So some of them, there'll be more or less work to do. So I, I've maybe only got three or four, like really actively in, in, in playtesting right now. Some might be in a, in more of a kind of pre-development stage. So where you're, where you're doing some work with a designer before you begin wider playtesting. And, and some of them we've, we've really finished the playtesting and we're just working on, uh, making sure the rules are really clear, preparing the, uh, learn to play materials to, to explain the game to people and then working with, with the art stages. Um, so while, you know, while 10 plus projects might seem like a lot, Often what I'm doing there is sending something off to uh, the artist or to an editor, such as yourself in some cases, um, and then leaving that with them for, you know, one week, two weeks even while they, while they work on it. So there's, there's again, that, that's where the kind, the kind of project management thing comes in and, and the time management as well. So I have to be working out what to prioritize and what to shuffle around, um, you know, across quite a large number of projects. What about playtesters? Are you the one who gathers them? Are you presented like with a list of people to talk to? And are you the person who directly gets feedback from playtesters? Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much yes to those. Um, depending on the company, there might be a different kind of process. So at GMT, we often send out calls for playtesters in the monthly newsletter, which is you know a super helpful way to to get lots of people. For, for a game uh, recently, we actually got uh, at least seventy signups on that, which, which is loads for, for this kind of scale of games. Um, and, uh, you know, for other companies, I might use other kinds of routes to recruit those. Um, and, and I'm then normally the one primarily communicating with them. So I'll, I'll, I'll send them some information about what, what we're looking for. Um, sometimes I'll use kind of feedback forms with certain quantitative data. So scores and outcomes and things. Um, and then I'll, I'll normally be, be talking with them. So answering questions they have and taking notes on the kinds of questions they have, which is often a really useful thing, you know, what, what's unclear to them. Um, and also trying to build a bit of a community there. Cause it's, it, it's nice. I think for play testers to get to know some other testers and you can really, um, build up some kind of interesting, uh, 
friendships even uh you know there's there's testers i've worked with on several different games and i know they're good so i can invite them back for, for future games and that's kind of a nice nice uh, thing to have so you're you're a heavy game guy uh in terms of uh what i see you talking about what you seem to be developing um so when you are dealing with games that are very long that have big scenarios mm -hmm. that are kind of chunky how do you make sure that you're giving enough attention to each scenario or do you and then also yeah. how do you hold play testers accountable for that or assess data for people who have had to put in a lot of time to fully yeah. test something out no that, that's a great question so you know the, the smaller two-player games are often much much easier to test so a two-player game which you can play in an hour or two hours you can get lots of iterations of um a longer two-player game isn't isn't so bad either because it's much easier to pair up two players to play through a game. Um, the longer, you know, four or five or six-player games, like like some of the coin games, are much more challenging to test in a in a kind of rigorous way because it, it can just just take a long time to sit down and do that. Um, so there's there's a couple of well, there's there's a few things to say. Um, you know, firstly, myself and the designer, maybe some some close uh, early. Um, People working on the game with them will will tend to play these quite quite a lot together just to get a general sense of this. Um, that that's useful to get you, you know lots of lots of repetition, but can be quite vulnerable to um, you know you know a kind of group thing. They can be things that we miss. So so it's important to do wider testing for that. Um, for the wider testing, I, I tend to think of there being two different kinds of testers. So you know when we had this you know seventy plus sign up for instance. I, I won't expect most of those to stick around for that long necessarily. So the the initial batch of you know a large number, fifty to hundred even testers, I'm looking more for general feedback on uh, you know clarity, whether their first game's enjoyable, whether there are things they, they don't like about it, um, you know just just kind of generally first impressions, and that that's really valuable. But then out of out of that, maybe only ten percent will stick around long term, um, and and what I'm looking for there is a core group of maybe five to ten people. Who can play the game uh, multiple times with each other, develop kind of different strategies and try different strategies. Um, and again, like that, that's that's too small a sample for kind of proper rigor in a sense. But it, it's it's enough of a sample that you can test these longer scenarios and get and get a good amount of feedback on them. Um, now, it's I mean, for for a game with with multiple long scenarios, it's it's just going to be hard to do a lot of very rigorous testing on those. And sometimes there might be some imbalances. Um, the good news is that in games with more than two players, a lot of those imbalances can be self-correcting. So the games I work on tend to be quite high interaction. So if you, if you have a four-player game with high interaction, um, it, it doesn't actually matter very much if, if one, one faction or one player position is, is a bit more powerful, because they'll be naturally reined in by, by the other players. And that, that might even be an intended part of the game. So something like People Power, um, a three-player game on the... Philippine EDSA revolution, um, you know, it intentionally has the government player in, in, a, in a stronger position than the other two, so they need to work together there. Um, and again, that, that needs quite a lot of testing to get right, but there, there is a kind of inbuilt self-correction which you don't have in a two-player game. So two-player games with long scenarios, you know, it's easier to get people to sit down and test, but harder to get right, and, and you do need to tweak things more there. Um, but so yeah, I mean, that's, that's just to say there are different kinds of strategies we use, and it's hard to get exactly right with you know, the time and the number of testers that, that we have sometimes for these games. So when something um, is maybe not going totally right, or uh, if you think that you have a fix, who mm -hmm. gets the ultimate say in how you move forward between mm -hmm. designer and developer? Because I mean, the designer is clearly the person who seems to go in the box, but it's also your job to make sure that a game isn't gonna like blow up when it hits Board Game Geek. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, Again, like I said a few times, it depends on the designer and my my relationship with them. So some designers, I might say, here's a problem, here's my solution, and they'll say, sure, give it a go. Other designers might want to really be quite closely involved in getting that right. Other designers at the start might say, actually, I'm 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 done with this more or less. You can you can figure it out, and that that happens sometimes, and that's okay. You know, then it's up up, up to me to work out how to solve that, and you know, I'll I'll, I'll clear it with them in the end. Um, e even when the designer wants to be involved, I I might try a few things myself before taking them some ideas or, you know, try a few things with some of the testers say, you know, let's try this, let's try that. Um, and, and then take it to them. Um, in, in most cases, you know, you're, you're going to want the designer to have, to have some say or some involvement in that. Um, and, and often they might have a better idea of how to fix it too. Um, but, uh, yeah, in, in terms of a final sign off that that's interesting. And I think it's kind of a publisher, uh, philosopher, deci um, philosophy decision in, in a way. So, you know, some publishers might want to take 
personal ownership of the final product and how it plays and so on. Um, some publishers, and I think GMT are a bit like this, are happier to let the designer kind of take the reins and take the lead on that. And that isn't to say that they abandon the designer. They're gonna they're gonna have somebody like like me helping out with that um, and giving some advice. But it's it's more of a kind of auteur directed project where where you'll you'll allow a designer to 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 make the game that they want to make and that's that's on the designer to some extent and what 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 we're doing then is is providing a platform for the, for the designer to to bring that game to the world um now you know if, if if the game was just absolutely terrible and there were huge problems with it then we'd have to intervene and try to fix it but there's there's some leeway i think for saying this isn't um exactly how i would have done it but this is how the designer wants to do it and that's actually a really important thing as a developer so that you know, if if you're also a designer like I am, there can be a tendency to to want to kind of remake something yourself. But but you need to you need to stop yourself if you feel that happening. You need to say, actually, what what I need to do is work out what game the designer wants to make, and work out how to make that happen. Um, so I'll I'll often go to a designer and say, you know, this is something the players are experiencing. Um, it's negative for these reasons, but I can see why you might want to do that. Is that really what you want to be happening? And if they say yes, then you know that's that's what the game's going to be, um, and that's fine. It, it's just to make sure that the experience and the outcomes are what they expect them to be and are desired and intentional. Um, and I need to, you know, the point at which I need to step back and even if I disagree, say that's fine. You know, you're you're the one doing it. Maybe you're right. Even you know, I I'm I'm not as experienced in design as lots of these people, so it's important to to let them take take the lead on that. Yeah. Speaking of not being as experienced, like I'm, I'm currently suffering through this because I've got a game design coming out. I have other designs in progress, but I feel so like raw and new all the time. Mm -hmm. um, when you're when you're a new developer, um, how do you get confident in terms of knowing that you're right, mm -hmm. knowing where to look? I mean, I feel like it's it probably gets easier with time, uh, but imposter syndrome is real. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. You know how do you how do you handle that at the start? Yeah, I mean, it's just really tough. Like, I, I personally struggle with this a lot. Um, I, you know, have a lot of self-doubt and lack of confidence, which some people sometimes are surprised by. Uh, you know, I often question whether I've done things right and get worried about that. Um, I, you know, this this is a bigger issue than just in development. But for, for development, of course, it's going to help once you have some games coming out or for design as well, and you start getting feedback on those. Um, it's also, you know, the playtesters can help with that a lot. You know, if, if the playtesters are enjoying the game, if people are playing it and having fun and you can observe that, then then that should be you know, a big plus. And even, even if the game's not perfect, if, if people are in, enjoying it, that, that's really all that, all that matters at the end of the day. Um, I guess, like, on the more general issue, I think it's important to have people you, you trust to give you on, on honest feedback on this. So, you know, close close friends or close colleagues who, who, will, who will tell you when you're doing something good and will tell you when there's a problem too. And, um, give you honest, honest feedback on that, and that that's hard to find, but it's it's important in any kind of creative work to have that. I think um, the other thing to say, of course, is that there are there are lots of games published of lots of different kinds of quality, and I think even if even if you have some doubts, it's it's still likely that what you're doing is 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 good enough in many ways, and isn't isn't the worst thing out there, you know. So so it's important not to beat yourself up too much and it's also important to let yourself make mistakes you know the first games you work on aren't going to be perfect and there's going to be um errors going to be things that go wrong and that that's okay that's fair uh so it also sounds like i mean you take a lot of feedback um so fortunately night witches play testers were super helpful and also nice which i really appreciated mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but you know, I've uh, I've been doing Elder Scrolls edits uh, and mm -hmm. also looking at feedback that two three play testers are giving. And like again, the feedback is super helpful. Sometimes it's pretty spicy. Yeah. So as a developer, you know, do you ever take any of it personally? And also, how do you uh, modulate that for designers who might? Yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, I, I I definitely take some of it personally sometimes, you know, um, on on a different different kinds of levels. So, if if I put quite a lot of effort into trying to make something clear, and then somebody says actually this is really unclear, um, that can hurt at first. But I think it's important to kind of put that to one side and say actually let's 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 hear what they're saying. Um, maybe they're just being really stupid, but maybe they've got a good point here. Uh, let's let's look at that. So yeah, there's a lot of kind of putting your ego to one side there. I think which is which is hard. Um, and and takes takes time um it, it also helps for me 
personally, and this is harder as a designer, probably even as a kind of professional developer, is is to think of it as as a job. You know, this is this is a job. This is not not my whole life. This is just just something I I do for work. Um, and, and also sometimes to think of the stakes. So so sometimes I think like. You know, I'm getting this kind of horrible feedback about this or whatever. But at the end of the day, it's just a game, and actually, it isn't that important. You know, there are there are there are worse things that I could be could be messing up, and that that kind of goes back to to your previous question too. So when I'm feeling really bad about something or really uncertain about something, I think like, really, what's what's the worst that happens if I publish this game and it doesn't work quite right, and it's a little bit inaccurate in some ways? Like, not it's it's not really that serious. Maybe maybe five thousand people in total will ever play it. Um, but but to get back to to your to your question now, the um the the negative feedback yeah so i i try to take that myself and i also try to feel that for the designers as you said so um i i, I do sometimes have the designers in direct contact with the testers um but i at least i i, I you know with with some designers with certain kinds of personalities i say maybe it would be better actually if you took a step back and i i take this feedback i collate it and then send you the the important points with some of the more negative gloss taken out um, I mean, this is probably something as a teacher that, that you've experienced as well or kind of know about that when you're giving feedback um, or, or getting feedback uh, as a teacher or as an academic or as a, as a writer or as a game designer, um, people can sometimes kind of phrase things in a way which is more negative or more critical than it really needs to be. And there are ways to kind of adjust that such that it's more palatable while still delivering all the same kinds of points. And this is something I've got wrong as well in the past. So I've given feedback to designers um either as a as a developer or as a kind of lead tester on some games which has been too 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 negative and, and phrased in, in too negative of a way um so i had to think quite carefully about how i how i present these things sometimes um and that's tough actually sometimes for cultural reasons too so i you know being british and working with a lot of americans i think i sometimes can phrase things in a way that's not negative enough um, but then sometimes can be too negative in different kinds of ways. And it's important that you're clear when there's a problem or something. Um, and that can be hard to communicate across these kind of cultural barriers sometimes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think about delivery feedback. I, it's, it's so hard to deliver real feedback in a way that the other person is able to hear. Yeah. Um, you know, as a reviewer, I don't really feel like my feedback is for the designer at that point. Mm -hmm. It's for people who might get the game and be engaging with it. Um, I know, I think other critics might feel differently. Um, <laughs> but even then, you know, I try really hard not to just take a giant dump on a game in like an aggressive way, mm -hmm. because I don't think that people can hear that. Yeah. Um, but you know, I also spend a lot of time being very careful with like little teenage hearts and minds. They are not careful with me. Whew. Exactly. If you want to get roasted, go to my job for a day. <laughs> yeah. I think one um, thing that's important with, with game feedback in particular is, and, and it's, this is part of the translation from playtesters to designer, is to say, you know, firstly, this is how the players felt about the game. Um, and then you can say that there are a number of, you know, very, very numerous reasons for this. Maybe this wasn't really the right kind of game for them. Or maybe there's an actual problem um, and then if there's an actual problem i'll try to explain what the problem might be and then also to give a possible solution and i think that's really important and this is probably the same for giving feedback to to students as well is to um is to say you know this is this is something you can do to fix it or to improve it um and they might not want to take that solution but you've at least ended on a more positive constructive paper i think that helps a lot oh yeah yeah, I think the hardest thing too is that when you get to a certain point in any work, like I felt like this about my dissertation at the end too, mm -hmm. um, it gets to the point where you're like, okay, well, what's the quickest, easiest fix I can do? But that doesn't yep. actually mean the best fix. Yep. How? Yep. So the other question, I guess, then is like timelines. If something's really mm -hmm. not working, but you have a deadline, what yeah. do you do? Yeah. Um, I mean, sometimes you need to settle for a good enough fix and not, and not the best fix. Um, sometimes it is just about making making it work well enough uh particularly when you're quite close to the deadline so when we're already i mean like all of this stuff i would ideally catch earlier but once you've already started saying sending things to layout or to an artist um you really don't want to be making major changes then because it's a lot more expensive it's a lot more time consuming it's just a lot more effort for everyone um so at that point i'll be thinking uh you know ideally we could have we could have done things in this way right from the start but actually here we are now let's just let's just do this this smaller fix um and and you, you just need to be pragmatic about that at, at certain points of the process so yeah 
even if it's not ideal. But at, at the same time, you you need to assess what kind of fix is needed. And you know, if if a, if a bigger change is is really is necessary, then you need to be honest with yourself and with others and say, let's let's do this if we can. Um, and that that's a hard call to make sometimes. Yeah, that's that's a tough one. So speaking of tough things, we're going to talk about your favorite topic now. Yeah, which is solo modes. Uh, so first of all, you make a lot of solo modes, but are you? Do you consider yourself a solo gamer? We haven't actually talked about this. But, so that's a good question, um, and the answer is yes and no because it depends what you mean. So I do I do a lot of solo gaming, uh, not not least when I'm designing or developing projects. So I think as a designer or a developer, you absolutely need to be comfortable playing solo. But that doesn't mean using a solo mode. So particularly for historical games, that means playing all sides at once, even if there's some hidden information, and kind of splitting your brain so you don't you don't think about that too much and and seeing how it all works and you, you need to be able to do that just because you can iterate much much faster without having to put together a group every time you need to do that so it's important at certain stages of design to be able to play the whole game by yourself so i, I do lots of that and i even enjoy doing that outside of work so um you know this, this is one reason why i particularly like the, the coin series really because there's uh largely no hidden information in any of these games so you can easily sit down and play all positions and you know see, see how it unfolds. So I do lots of solo gaming like that, which I think is much more common in the historical gaming or, or the wargaming community than it is in, in broader kind of hobby hobby gaming community. Um, I, I tend not to use solitaire modes for games that, that often. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't personally enjoy the additional cognitive load you have there. I feel like that gets in the way of the game a bit. Um, so I'm, I'm personally not that kind of solo gamer, even if I play games by myself quite, quite often, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I would say if, you, if you're playing by yourself and you're doing it for fun, at that point, you have crossed over into the world of being a solo gamer. But sure. I, we all yeah. argue about definitions, but yeah. that'd be me. However, even if you don't like to play solo modes, you do make them mm -hmm. for coin. So what yeah. solo modes have you made and what yeah. kind of process goes into that? So the solo modes I've made have pretty much exclusively been using the, the card-based um, solo system for coin, which um, uh bruce came up with for uh, um gandhi um he's the designer of gandhi um him and jason carr worked on that together um this this card based solo mode and how that works is so prior to that the coin games would have these quite complex flow charts so you know it'd be if if it's this turn and if this situation do that this kind of whole page of a flow chart um the the, the amazing insight bruce and jason had is to to it's flip that onto these cards. So each card is actually a, basically a mini flowchart, but they're much simpler. And you draw one uh, semi at random each turn. And then it says, you know, if the board state is like this, and that top priority will be looking for something critical. So, you know, if you don't have enough bases out, uh, then next step, are you able to play some bases? Okay, next step, play some bases. If not, it would flip over to the back of the card, and then there'd be something which would try to engineer the game state such that you can resolve the first condition, if that makes sense. Um, so it's working, it's working through like this. Um, I actually came up with a name for this system. So Bruce had done it for Gandhi, and then he'd made one for Fire in the Lake, so kind of a retrofit for Fire in the Lake. Um, I came up with the overall name for the system, which is now called the Jackard system. And this is a little bit of a pun because it's Jackard, but it's uh, also harking back to the Jackard loom, which is an automatic loom from the early 19th century, um, and basically a very early uh, computer. So it, so it, used, it was programmed with punch cards, the same as early uh, digital computers were programmed with, um, but it's just just a loom. So I thought that, that was a cool name for it. Um, my, I mean, to give some context to that, my, my previous life, I was working as a philosopher of AI and computation. So I was quite interested in these in these kinds of things. Um, and there is another connection there. Uh, this is this is really getting off topic now. There is another connection there insofar as I think how these how these card based solo systems work is actually quite similar to some principles in certain kinds of um, AI work. Uh, so there's this idea from Rodney Brooks. Um, or the subsumption architecture. And basically what this does is there are a number of kind of switches or priorities and you, rather than explicitly doing a lot of stuff, you just revert to that behavior as a kind of default. And that, that's how these systems work. So it will kind of default to a certain thing if nothing else is a higher priority. And this is a very kind of elegant way to, to make the system work. Um, but uh, I, so I, so Bruce did Gandhi and Bruce did uh, Trung for Fire and the Lake. And then Bruce also did uh, Taeson, which was for the Fall of Saigon expansion to Fire Over Lake. And that's where I first got involved in this system. So I helped with the testing and development of Taeson quite a bit while I was working on Fall of Saigon. Uh, since then, I've done Jacquard systems for People Power, 
which is called Bonifacio, and for Sovereign of Discord, which is an expansion for Fire Emblem Lake called Min Mao. And th these are all named after historical figures associated with the country, but not with the conflict, is the general principle. So, because you don't want the bot to be named after one particular side. So, it's a kind of older historical figure often. Um, so, yeah, People Power, uh, Sovereign of Discord, and more recently, I've been doing one for Red Dust Rebellion. Um, which is obviously in the future. So we named it Curiosity after the Curiosity rover, which I think is quite cute. Uh, and I will soon be working on one for China's War, the next coin series volume. And I've also done one for the Pure Land al already. So I've already done that um, kind of ready to go. Um, so those are the ones I've done. So that's, I mean, that's not that many. That's, that's three of these systems. Um, one, one thing to say about them, people say, so, so, when we were working on, for instance, the British Way and Jester Robin Hood, we decided not to do solo systems because they are small two-player games. So in principle, it should be easier to find a partner. Um, the British Way is easier to play two-handed for that reason as well. Um, for the British Way, there are four games in one box. So I would have had to make eight different solo bots for each side of those games. For Jester Robin Hood, there um, is some hidden information, which just makes it a bit more difficult. Um, so we didn't do solo mode for those. People sometimes say, oh, but you it's so easy to make these coin solo modes now. There's this existing structure. Can't you just kind of plug it in? Do it. Done. That's just not true at all. E each of these is is really custom built from the ground up. Um, we, we have a kind of a kind of master kind of working document documentation about how the system works. But you, you need to study the game very closely, you know, figure out good strategy for each faction, and then uh, you know, custom design this set of cards, the set of tables. To each of those and that takes a huge huge amount of work really um i would say um almost approaching as much work as the original design does just to do the solo design the testing for it development of it um so yeah it's 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 a lot of effort and there are good reasons why we choose not to do that for some games that said uh is there a common starting point for mahiz i mean it sounds like there's a document yeah. that talks about how the system works so when you're beginning to make one mm -hmm. um does that process start the same way each time yeah, it does. And we've got quite clear documentation for this, which which is great. Um, Bruce and Jason wrote this up together, and it's super helpful for anyone else wanting to work on these systems for other games. Um, it, you you start, so there are, in addition to these cards, there are tables for kind of common actions. So if you're placing a um, certain kind of cube down, there'd be a place cubes column, and that would, you know, go through some, this is where you get the kind of architecture again. So, you know, if, if there's one of these places, place it there, otherwise place it there, and so on. Um, the beginning of it is is to work on that table. So you and and this is actually where you need to be able to do the other kind of solo playing to do this. So you need to be able to play play multi handed. Because so what you do is you sit down and play multi handed, and you say, okay, what are the common actions for this faction, and what are the the priorities for them, and then you work on this table. So you 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 mock up a first version of a table, and then play um, you know choosing which action to do for each faction, but. Uh, placing the pieces on the board using this table and, you know, ch changing it as you go. And there's, and there's lots of iteration, you know, I'm often changing it live as I'm working on it. I'm like, oh, right, there's this other priority, which is really obvious. I'll just add that in now. And, and you do that until the table is working pretty well. Um, then you move on to, so with the coin system, you need to choose which kind of actions you to do, you know, whether you do an operation, whether you play the event. So you come up with a little table for that. Um, and you start thinking about which events are more important than others. So we call some events critical, which you always play some events performed, which you sometimes play, and some events you might just never play um, for, for some faction, and, and you work on that next. And then you, you're continuing to play using just these bits of the system while you do that. And then maybe finally you get to the cards, and then you need to sit down and think, what kind of um, six major objectives or kind of situations are there for this faction, normally based off their victory conditions, but maybe some other things. And then you start thinking about what kinds of board states should trigger certain actions. And then you start putting together these cards and working on the logic for the cards. Um, that's going to take a lot of work as well, because you need to make sure the logic covers most of the relevant situations and this kind of thing. Um, yeah, and then you start working on that. And there's a few other bits you can do along the way, like the priority for which pieces to remove first and stuff like this. But those are the main steps. Um, and at each of those steps, you need to be playing the game by yourself multiple times while you work on it. Oh, that's interesting. So. You said that you prefer to play multi-handed, but when you have done your own deck, um, mm -hmm. do you find that you still prefer to play multi-handed or do you enjoy your own work? Uh, I, I enjoy, no, no is the answer. I, I don't enjoy <laughs> using it that much. Um, 
for me, so this is very different for different people, I think. For me, because I work on these games so much and I know the system so well, uh, and I'm so used to playing multi-handed, it's, it's, much, it's much, much, much quicker for me to play multi-handed. So I can play one campaign of a four-player coin game in about 20 minutes. Um, with the bot system, it's going to take me closer to an hour because you need to stop on each one, you know, look at the table. Whereas, I, you know, if it's placing gorillas, say, I can just look at the board and say, right, there, 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 that's where the gorillas go. Uh, with the table, I need to look at each row and think, okay, here, and that one, and that one, and this for each single piece I'm placing down. So it just takes so much longer for me and isn't a particularly enjoyable experience. Um, the bit I do kind of enjoy now, and don't tell Jason I said this, is I, I enjoy the, the, the kind of meta game of creating the bot system itself. And that, that's kind of like a game for me, or at least a kind of a puzzle to solve. So I enjoy solving that puzzle. And then, you know, sometimes when we start testing these, someone will come back and say, oh, it's doing this stupid thing in this situation. And then, you know, that, that as a discrete little puzzle to think, how do I prevent that behavior or cause a different kind of behavior? That, that's kind of interesting as, as an intellectual challenge. But it's, it, it's more like a puzzle than a game, if that makes sense. So it's, it's, like, it's like doing a crossword puzzle or something for me. And I, and I quite enjoy that, that bit of it as a mental challenge. I, I don't enjoy the outcome so much, which is a funny kind of situation to be in. <laughs> so one thing that's really interesting is, you know, you mentioned AI is working on this. I think one thing that's really cool, actually, now the next time I play a body like you've made, now the next time I like play people power, it'll be kind of mm -hmm. fun because it'll be like, oh, this is what Joe thought was important yeah. Yeah, yeah. in this game. Like, it's almost like kind of meeting you across the table in a way. Yeah. Um, so I guess do different people's solo modes have different quirks based on how they play yeah that's a great question and i think a really important point and something i try to be aware of when i'm working on them because you you certainly will tend to make them play the way you play and when i'm playing coin games that can sometimes end up being um overly conservative so i'll tend to maybe slightly too narrow-mindedly pursue the objectives of that faction rather than doing other stuff and that can often that can often be a good strategy to be honest in in, in coin games i think people get People kind of lose lose sight of the end goal, and this this kind of kind of relates to testing more generally. So I'll I'll identify what I need to do to win, and then quite narrow mindedly see that sometimes. Um, but you can get too focused on that, and then not not you know be not dealing with with other factions, not not messing with other people's scores, and that's something uh, I maybe have a tendency to slip into. So I need to think about that and change that. Um, and that's also why it's important um, prior to this process, I think, to play with other people more so you know i i, I do lots of multi-handing but it's important to play with other people and also just to observe other groups playing so i can do that and then see other strategies which i might not have thought of and then also you know program those into the into the bot system um uh, but yeah you're you're absolutely right that there, there can be you know there's going to be some character some some of some of the personality or the playing style of of the designer in the system um and that's nice in a way. So, you know, when my bots beat people, that, that feels a little bit like I'm, I'm beating them, or at least there's some, you know, I, I have some role in that. Um, uh, but, but it does mean that you might, you might miss some things. Um, and that's why, yeah, observing different players before that is important. And also observing people using your system afterwards is important because they might find a way to trick it or to confuse it with something which, which, which you hadn't noticed. Yeah. But also, I mean, sort of back to AI and programming, you're an actual expert on this, which I think is maybe we have a lot of opinions and not a lot of experts in our field on this at the moment. So yeah. when people talk about AI, yeah. are we even like talking about it properly? Like as somebody who actually knows what they're doing, like when we mm -hmm. use AI for a solo mode, I'm assuming that still would mean something quite different from AI. Like I can remove the background from this picture in Canva and yeah. AI, like when we're talking about art. You know, how yeah. do you, as somebody who actually knows what they're talking about, um, feel watching all these yeah, things yeah. play out? So this is something I've, I've given up fighting to some extent, but I would I would really much prefer to reserve the term AI for mu much, much smaller set of things, maybe none of which we currently have. Um, I, I think it's possibly unhelpful to do this. So for instance, the, the current, you know, the things people are very excited about these days, so ChatGPT and um, the AI image generation and so on, um, I think there's, I think it's a bit, a bit early to call those AI. Um, now it's it's tricky because it, it gets into you know questions about how how the human mind works and how how natural cognition works, and and we don't know much about that either, to be honest. Um, but uh, what one you know even if we're going to call these all AI, it is important to distinguish between certain kinds of systems. So as as you as you hinted at the you know the very popular things like ChatGPT and the image creation uh, systems at the minute, 
uh, working in a very different way to the uh, coin bots which I work on. Um, and and this, I mean, this actually goes right back to to quite fundamental questions in the history of artificial intelligence. Um, so basically, it's it's a distinction between a between a rules based system, um, which just follows kind of a fixed set of rules, and uh, a more open ended kind of generative system, which is what lots of the modern um, systems people are playing around with these days do. Um, and what what they do basically is take huge amounts of data and predict the the most likely next step. Um, and some some video game AIs work like this nowadays, I think as well. And some even some digital AIs for digital board games, I think, use this as well. And and what they'll do is they'll be trained on lots of previous games um, by by human players, um, and then use that to figure out what to do next. Um, and that's quite different to the coin systems, which uh, just have these explicit rules programmed in. Um, now, of course, the Generative systems might might be picking up on certain kinds of implicit rules, and they might they might look like they follow rules. Um, you know whether something that looks like it's following a rule is really following a rule is is again just a whole different whole different kind of question which we could talk about for hours. Um, but yeah, they're they're very different approaches, and they work in very different ways, and they have different kinds of limitations. Um, it would be almost impossible for us to do the generative approach for the games we're working on just because there's not enough data. You would you would need you would need thousands of of games, um, or you would need uh, a powerful enough computer to get the system to play the game against itself thousands of times. Um, when when it's programmed, th th this could be possible. So you know, there's now quite a few games on 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 Rally the Troops where all the rules are explicitly defined. So you you could theoretically train a um, uh, a generative system on on this and get it to play lots of games against itself build up an AI, that, 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 that could be one approach that, that would work. Um, but, but you need to have already programmed the game in that way to do that. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, we won't talk about the ethical aspects of it in yeah. this conversation, just because it derails everything every time. And mm -hmm. I mean, you know, but um, that's, that's really interesting. I remember I just took one computer science class in school. And what my teacher impressed on us was that computers actually, like, no matter how impressive it looks, or, you know, if it fails, both of those are the result of human planning yeah. and working. Like a computer can only do what you tell it to, yeah. no matter how fancy the result looks. Um, and I, I, I think that's very, like, do you see, I mean, you know, I think in a small version, right, when we talk about coin bots, you see human intention mm -hmm. and preference, like, baked in. Um, do you think that that's still true? for generative AI, even if we don't necessarily understand that, like it's still coming from human data. It's still looking yeah, at human behavior. Yeah. Like, so there are, there's at least two or three different things going on there, I think. So firstly, there are the, so the way the system is set up in the first place will, um, you know, prefer certain kinds of patterns to other kinds of patterns. And that may be done more or less intentionally by the designers, but that's there. So the system itself isn't neutral to begin with. Um, and that isn't to say it's biased in any particular way that we would recognize, but it will it will have certain kinds of biases for certain kinds of data structures and so on, which it which it finds more more interesting in some sense. You know, that's that's one way to think about it. Um, so that that's already in the system, and then there's also the data you train the system on, as you said. And this is a huge issue. Um, you know, I haven't, I haven't been working on this closely for a while, but when I used to teach uh, AI ethics, we we'd look at it a lot. So for for, for instance, you'll You'll get systems for facial recognition, which can't can't recognize uh, non-white faces. You know, can't can't recognize black faces or, or struggle with this. And this was happening with one of these systems, which is used to check if students aren't cheating during uh, online tests. Um, a few years ago, is it is it couldn't recognize certain kinds of faces, so it would flag you as cheating because you're no longer in the room or something, and then you fail the test. So that that's a kind of obvious bias which comes in through 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 data sets. Um, and then, but there's a third thing as well, which is you know what 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 these systems are used for. So you can you can use the, the outputs and the outcomes in certain ways, and that, that's another kind of yeah another kind of thing that's in there. Um, and this is all true still of the coin bots, insofar as um, you know we're creating them with certain outcomes in mind. And you know with, with the coin bots, there are certain things we abstract, so they don't they don't follow entirely all the rules, but they almost follow all the rules of the games. But there are some decisions we've made there which which change how they behave. And and as 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 we were talking about earlier, it will tend to. It will tend to play in in a style similar to me because I've I've trained it basically, um, so yeah, there's that, that that's happening in in both these cases, I'd say. 
Okay, that's so interesting. But there's one more. I mean, we have limited time. There's one more trail I want to follow mm -hmm. uh, with you on here, which is so you primarily or entirely work on historical games. Yes. Uh, uh, well, except for games like Red Dust Rebellion, which is set in the future, and Jest of Robin Hood, which is kind of historical, but not. Um, but broadly speaking, yes. I mean, more more generally than that, I tend to work on what we might call conflict simulation games. I guess rather than other games. That's not um, that's not necessarily going to be true forever. That's that's what I I currently work on, what I'm particularly interested in. But I I wouldn't be opposed to doing other work. Yeah. So I guess it just leads me to ask: When you are doing development, are you thinking only about mechanisms and systems, mm -hmm. or are you also looking into the historical grounding of the work and making sure that it's expressing, I guess, what it's supposed to? um and you know how do you how do you handle that aspect of the work yeah that's a great question um i i think i've got some duty as a developer to at least check a little bit of a history and of course i can't do as much research as the designer will have done um but i do try to read at least one book on each each game i'm working on and i will actually ask the designer for a recommendation there because uh this again is an interesting way to figure out what the designer wants to do so uh i mean as i'm sure you know history isn't neutral so whichever book the designer recommends will will tell you their kind of take on the history and you know if, if that seems really bad maybe then i'll i'll talk to the designer maybe i'll i'll question them about that but if it's just a particular interpretation of things uh you know it, it doesn't need to be one i agree with but by reading the book they recommend i will understand what they're trying to show with the game um so i i, I do that and i read at least one book if i'm particularly interested i might read more but i i, I try to do that just to get some background understanding and that's important not just to you know check the history, check the designers done their work, which I'm doing to some extent, but I'm, you know, I'm never going to have the knowledge to do that for every game. Um, but it's more important really to, to understand what, what the game is meant to be, what, what the simulation is meant to be of, so that I can, I can help them uh, get towards that goal. Nice. Have you ever had a situation where you really did have a serious disagreement with a designer's take and mm. what did you do? Mm. That's a good question. I need to think carefully about how much I should say. Um, I, I, I've had cases where I'm, 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 you know, I, I know enough about a topic that I'm at least worried about the the perspective of the designers taking. You know, it, it seems like it might be outdated. And in that case, I'll I'll first go to someone else I know who might who might know about the history. So you know, I, I work with lots of designers who are also historians, or also social scientists. You know, ha have some kind of um, expertise in these areas. And I'll I'll ask them what they think about it, and that can help me check if if I if I have the right kind of instinct there that there's something not quite right. Um, if if that seems to be the case, I'll I'll ask the designer about it. I'll just say you know this seems like uh, maybe quite an outdated perspective. What you take on that? Um, they might they might say oh yeah, but I think it's still right and really dig their feet in, uh, or they might say like oh yeah, that's right. Let let's think about some other kinds of options here. Um, or there's a third thing which is that you might say that's right, but I want this game to tell a story about that outdated perspective. And then it's more of a framing thing. And, and that can be OK, I think. So for instance, Twilight Struggle is a good example of this. Um, it, it's quite explicitly presented as um, almost a kind of fever dream of Cold War leaders focusing on domino theory and this particular idea about how international politics works. And, and Jason Matthews doesn't think that's uh, correct necessarily. But the game is trying to evoke a particular kind of feeling um, of people in the 50s and 60s and 70s who saw the world this way and and you know maybe that framing could be clearer but but i think like making making that framing explicit sometimes can be enough even if even if uh, history doesn't seem quite, quite right um i mean i mean just the robin hood is another good example um so fred's quite quite clear in the supporting materials that he's not trying to tell a kind of a, a true analysis of the real robin hood or anything it's more about uh, different different versions of Robin Hood and how we how we perceive those and how we think about them. So there can be a kind of historiographical twist there, which, which helps with the framing. Um, but you know, back back to the worst case scenario where the designer seems to have a really outdated view, which I just disagree with, uh, and they're not budging on it. I'll I'll normally go to the publisher then and say like this is a concern I have. Um, and yeah, not 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 to say this has necessarily happened or not, but in the worst case scenario, I might say I, I'm not comfortable working on this game anymore because it seems like a really kind of bad. Um, you know, kind of morally bad uh, way to present the history. Um, or, the des or, or they might be able to talk to the designer or something like that. But there's, there's a point at which it's just out, out of my control and all I can say is I, I'm not comfortable working on this. Um, so that, that's something which I would, I would do in, in the most extreme cases. But hopefully I'd, I'd be able to 
resolve that with the designer first. And it could just be something they've overlooked or something they've missed. Yeah. No, I mean, I I always like to take on people who care about history and games at the yeah. same time. It's a good thing. So uh, kind of softy questions leading into the end. Um, I guess, uh, first, what games have you been playing that actually bring you some joy? Mm. Not for work. Oof. Good question. Um, I play so many games for work, it's hard to say. But uh, what have I played recently for joy, not for work? I played played dune a few weeks ago with some friends which was a lot of fun um the big which you know, one classic the classic six player one um but the, the the modern version of that one yeah yeah i haven't played any of the other gene games uh but yeah that classic one is great really love it it's a lot of fun um the the not for work question kind of blurs because i play a lot of games which are like kind of kind of like background work for work but we we played angola with the same group as well recently which is a classic uh four player war game which is a lot of fun uh quite chaotic that was that was really great um I've been playing uh, Kings, the King's Dilemma, with with a kind of in, with, with my in person group here, which is this. Um, it's almost like a role playing game, and I think that's the right way to think about it. So you're members of a King's Council over several different sessions, maybe up to fifteen over the whole campaign, and you're vo you're you're basically just voting on different dilemmas that come up. So so the actual gameplay is very thin, and I think if you were just focusing on the gameplay, it would be very dull. But with the right group of people, and this is this is true of, of so many games, it's it, it, it's really great. So you really get into character. I'm playing this one particular house who got a real chip on their shoulder and like blame everyone else for everything that goes wrong. So you know, I, I can just seize any opportunity to like lay the blame on someone else or like scheme and this kind of thing. Um and that and that's really fun. So that that's been a really nice one. I've been playing, you know, not not a complex simulation or a war game at all. Uh much closer to a role playing game really, but uh, having a great time um with with some friends. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and then if you uh, want to be found online, where can you be found by people who want to follow your work? Uh, good question. Um, so now, well, uh, on BoardGameGeek, I've got a BoardGameGeek profile, and that says all the games I've been working on. Might be slightly updated, so I'll update it. Um, I, I'm semi-active on Twitter. I don't tend to post very much, but I, I'm around and sometimes interact with people on Twitter. They're just under Jerry Dewhurst. It's quite easy to find me, I think. Um, maybe Joe underscore Dewhurst uh that's that's really it in terms of like my public profile i i've been meaning to set up like a portfolio website but haven't done that yet so i will maybe try and do that uh, soon fantastic uh and joe thank you so much for coming on it's been so fun to like just get to hang out for an hour and i know that i'll get to torture you uh via homo ludanes at various points but yeah. it's it's been good to chat yeah, yeah. Thanks very much for having me on. Really nice to chat to you, and really interesting. And I'm glad we didn't get too diverted because I could talk for hours about what what rule following is and these kinds of things. So good, good not to let me do that. That might be a future conversation. Yeah. Don't think you're off the hook just yet. Uh, but for now, everybody out there, uh, please like, subscribe, uh, comment, ask questions, and most of all, happy gaming.